Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Royal Family of Gondal, our Honorary Director, Mr. Ashish Doshi, and our Curator, Mr. Asad Lalji, welcome to the Royal Opera House, Mumbai, India's only surviving opera house and the city's cultural crown jewel. We believe that literature is an integral part of the culture of any city and that Mumbai is no different. We regularly collaborate with the biggest lit fests, publishing houses, authors and intellectuals, and important personalities to give events to the city, which we hope will long be remembered. Our stage has become synonymous with literature and books, having launched titles for a number of prominent and eminent authors. And tonight, we're happy to host yet another important voice. Westland Publications, the Royal Opera House Mumbai, and Avid Learning present an exclusive evening of music and conversation around the Mumbai launch of the sixth string of Vilayat Khan by author and journalist Namita Devi Deal. To kick off the evening, please welcome Mr. Gautam Padmanabhan, CEO of Western Publications, who will now say a few words. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Good evening. On behalf of Westland, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's launch. When the Music Room was published over a decade ago, it marked a shift in the way Indian classical music could be written about. The honesty and grace with which Namita combined her own personal journey with that of Dondutai, her teacher, struck a chord in readers both initiated and lay. This new book on Ustad Vilayat Khan treads a similar delicate balance between the writer and her subject. It is a tribute to the musician, as well as an exploration of the man and his relationship with music. The technical innovations, the heart-sprung compositions, the passion and the frenzy that transformed the sitar into an instrument that came as close to the human voice as possible, Namita writes of these with the understanding and empathy that only someone trained in music could bring to the subject. We are delighted that Westland is publishing this gem that is bound to find its place among the truly memorable books of our time. Even when we were reading the initial manuscript, we knew we had to do something special to enhance the reading experience in many ways. And for us to do this, it required finding partners who were equally inspired to work with us. As you read the book, you immediately desire to listen to the music. We first thought of packaging the book with a CD but when we started exploring the arcane world of music licensing, we quickly gave up. Besides, very few people listen to CDs today. As luck would have it, Amazon Prime Music was launched earlier this year, and when we got in touch with his director, Sahas Malhotra, he was immediately on board. Streaming being the present and future of music, and with no legal issues to tackle, this was the perfect solution for us. So a unique playlist was born, as Namita put together a string of pieces that works as a soundtrack to the book. For example, as you read the section on his pioneering background score for Satyajit Ray, you can hear the music he composed for the film Jal Sagar, and so on. In a way, this playlist is a musical representation of Ustad Vilayat Khan's life and works beautifully as a counterpoint to Namita's words. The second stroke of serendipity was the launch of the India store of the audiobook portal Audible. In fact, Audible was launched only a couple of weeks ago at this very venue, the Royal Opera House. While audiobooks are essentially spoken word renditions of texts, the opportunity to enhance the experience once again presented itself. And when we contacted Jai Zende of Audible, he immediately agreed to explore musical additions to the audiobook. The audiobook, which will be launched a little later, probably early next month, will feature not only music, but conversation between the maestro's son, Hidayat Khan, and Lyle Wachowski, the music producer, who released some of Khan Sahib's memorable recordings. To the best of my knowledge, both the playlist and the audiobook with bonus features are first, perhaps anywhere in the world. And I take this opportunity to thank Sahas and Jay for their passion and commitment to the cause. In fact, Saas is here today in the audience. Last but not the least, I would like to thank Namita for investing her faith in Westland, and more importantly, in a fledgling imprint called Context, and for giving us this unique opportunity 
to showcase the musical genius of Ustad Vilayat Khan to a new generation. Thank you. And I take this opportunity now to invite the star of this, today's evening, Namita, to take over the proceedings. Thank you. 1952, Delhi. It had been five years since independence, and India was still in the mood for celebration. Two young string musicians were performing together at the Constitution Club grounds, a sitar player called Ravi Shankar, and a sarod player whose name was Ali Akbar Khan. Both were in their early 30s and students of Baba Alauddin Khan, an ambidextrous musician with a goatee, famous for his genius and his temper. Accompanying them that evening were two tabla masters from Banaras, Kanthe Maharaj and his nephew, Kishan. A covered stage had been constructed on the grounds. The musicians walked up, one behind the other, all wearing white. While they were tuning their instruments, a young man in a black kurta and rimless glasses suddenly appeared in front of the stage, clutching his sitar. He addressed the audience in beautiful Urdu. This stage has so many gorgeous flowers, I would like to add my fragrance by joining my friends Robuda and Aluda this evening. A murmur of surprise went around the audience. The performance was meant to be a duet. Who was this? Although he spoke poetically, this man had the air of a human detonator. He held his instrument as if it were a weapon, pointing it at phantom enemies. His eyes blazed behind the glasses he wore. Some recognized him as Vilayat Hussain Khan, the son of Inayat Hussain Khan. A few people started cheering. The young man jumped onto the stage and the other musicians made space for him. It was a formidable sight. Ali Akbar sat in the center, looking vaguely daunted. On either side of him sat the two sitar players, both strikingly good-looking men with large foreheads suggesting grand destinies. Two grand Miraj Tanpuras at the back and two Chicago radio mics in front. It was a picture of perfect melodic symmetry. Ravi Shankar made the customary gesture asking for permission to begin. He then struck the notes of Rag, Maj, Khamaj. He played for a few minutes, then turned to Vilayat Khan, giving him the cue. The younger musician played the same riff, but in a more lilting style. They meandered through the alap for almost an hour, building gradually, thoughtfully, teasing the ma, the rag's dominant note, the maj in the kamaj. At some point, it became evident to the audience that a subtle musical duel was taking place. By the time the faster tan started, the notes had become sharp arrows shot with the intention to annihilate. Ali Akbar Khan hardly got to play. So after a while, he quietly put his sarod down and looked bewildered. His head turned from left to right and right to left as the sharp shooters on either side battled on. At one point, Ravi Shankar hit a set of high notes in the third octave. Like a kite catching its prey, Vilayat Khan scooped up the lid of his little metal oil box and, instead of using his fingers, pressed it on the strings of his instrument. The sound that emerged of amplified metal on metal was audacious and amazing. Suddenly, Hafiz Ali Khan got up from his seat and applauded. Mar Dala! He killed him. Others sitting next to him also cheered. Baba Alauddin Khan also jumped up and started shouting. You have defamed my boy Shoror Bacha, you son of a pig, you scoundrel! Followed by even choicer expletives in Bengali. The music stopped abruptly. 24-year-old Vilayat Khan was declared the winner in the Battle of the Sitars. He had clearly taken liberties with the music and even gone a little beyond the parameters of the rag, but he had created an impact. Ravi Shankar did not look pleased. This brash and brilliant musician, seven years younger than him, had humiliated him in public. He quietly got up and left the stage. The epic concert was discussed by Delhi's music world for days afterwards. 
Who is this Vilayat Khan, the long lost son of Inayat? The two musicians promised each other they would never perform together. Kishan Maharaj later told someone, if these two eyes of India play together again, one will shut forever. I now would like to request uh, Apurva Asrani, a friend, a lover of music, a filmmaker, and the person who um, brought to life two incredible biopics, Shahid and Aligarh, to join me on stage for a conversation about our favorite musician. Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Opera House. Hi, Namita. Thank you for having me here today. It is such an honor to be sitting on this stage this evening, uh, not just because it is uh, the Grand Opera House, stunning, stunning venue with so much history, uh, but because, also because it is uh, the launch of uh, this incredible book uh, about a very great man and a great artist, Ustad uh, Vilayat Khan Sahib. Uh, and to be sitting here is such an honor. In fact, uh, I just finished reading the book this morning and uh, uh, it was absolutely riveting. Uh, and I have to commend you on, on a book that uh, has so many worlds within worlds, like I was telling you earlier. Uh, you know, incredible character who, who didn't belong to one place. Uh, he, he lived in so many parallel uh, galaxies and universes uh, and, and uh, gave a part of himself to each of these uh, places. Um, and, 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 and a man and, and an artist so pure and so uh, w with, with an art I think that's uh, unparalleled. But yet I, I keep, I, I wonder why it is uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, this is his, his, was his pet peeve, uh, why it is Pandit Ravi Shankar, uh, whose name has become more synonymous with the sitar. So, from what I understand, um, I think it was one of his many peeves. Um, it didn't dictate his life, though it did seem to be an undercurrent. And yet, I'm told by the buzurgs who I've interviewed that there was a kind of an unwritten respect between the two, which existed, but um, you know, when it came to external applause and when it came to all the psychophancy that exists and the government ap uh, applause and the government awards, that's where the troubles happened. And then there was also one really awful episode where um, a CD of the music for Jalsaghar had arrived with his, with Ravi Shankar's name instead of Vilayat Khan's name, by, written by some terrible, um, you know, person who was doing the credits and didn't pay attention. And you see, the the whole problem was that sitar had become synonymous with Ravi Shankar and people just didn't bother with the rest. And so um, I think it bothered him to some extent and yet it didn't because he chose to remain authentic and uh, to his aesthetic certainties, to his um, idea of what music was. And he had many opportunities to become a collaborative artist just like Ravi Shankar, um, but opted not to. Uh, there's this wonderful story about him um, meeting Isaac Stern while he was in uh, Washington, D.C. at a concert. And Isaac Stern said, hey, why don't we do a, a gig together at some point? You know, it'll be wonderful and um, we could try something out. And he um, sat him down and gave him a really lovely hug. And, and he said to him that, you know, I um, think that both our musics are so special that uh, why should we spoil either one by doing this? Let's just go deeper and deeper and deeper into each of our music. Otherwise, our instruments might go the fate of the flamenco guitar, which is almost extinct. And so I think that to some extent, he believed this very deeply. And to some extent, he was positioning himself as someone very different from Ravi Shankar. So I, I think that, that that's partly what was going on over there. Um, he, he sort of, he, you know, every artist has to create a uniqueness about him and if he had followed the collaborative route, it may not have worked because Ravi Shankar had got there first in the 60s with the Beatles and with Yehudi Menuhin. Um, but I suspect it was much more than just um, 
a way of, of distinguishing himself. I think he genuinely believed in, um, you know, just going deep. Would you call him a purist then? I, I think in my limited understanding of music, yes, I would. I think that he really um, uh, chose to work with the rag, with the in integrity of the rag, and just didn't move horizontally to experiment, uh, not to say that one's better or worse or more authentic or not. It's just that I think he chose to do that. And I think for him, fame wasn't the overriding factor at all, uh, because at the height of his career, he moved from Bombay to um, the hills of Shimla, where the nearest concert hall was like 70 miles away. So I think he just did what he really felt like. So is, uh, I mean, he didn't, didn't uh, wasn't uh, Khasab conferred with the Padma Shri and then the Padma Bhushan? Did he, didn't he reject these awards? He did, because he really believed that no one had the right to arbiter art. And he used to find it very offensive that even radio directors who knew so little compared with him and any of the people that had gone through the kind of grind and rigor that they had um, could uh, uh, be the persons who decided, you know, the grading, like you have artist gradings in the radios and those decide both the fees and the time slotted. And he was like, this is absolutely absurd. And I think he's quite right because he just didn't believe in politics in art. It was something that was way beyond all that. And so he just said, I don't need all this. And he really felt strongly about it. So he stopped practicing, in, I mean, he stopped performing in the radio for many years from 1952 onwards, uh, which for him would have been an ex you know, exceptional platform in those days because there was nothing else out there really. Um, and uh, so it's, it's quite, um, he, he just rejected all that. He rejected what he believed was bullshit fame. Hmm. And, and do, do, do you think he, he had a way with people and what, what it comes across, he comes across as someone who, you know, probably, uh, you know, couldn't manage his own funds correctly. He had Arvind Bhai for that. <laughs> you know, I was coming to Arvind Bhai, you know. So how important it is for a great artist, because I think a lot of artists are so much like children forever. You know, that creativity of a child that you see uh, alive in a great artist, I mean, it just tells you that, you know, they've, they've held on to that part of their childhood. But then how do they, you know, manage funds, deal with people, market themselves? Uh, isn't it important for them to have uh, people that nurture them and patrons in their life, you know, who would... Yeah, I, I think we should talk a little bit of... I'm so deeply honored that Arvind Bhai is right here. Arvind Bhai is um, Vilayat Khan's senior most student uh, who knew him from the time they were both 17. And it's people like, like this who... Um, I, I, I'll just give you a little background. So I don't think two people could be any more different. Uh, Arvind Bhai is a strictly vegetarian, very um, home-loving uh, person. He's a businessman and... Um, Vilayat Khan was kind of the opposite on many levels. Okay. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Um, and so, uh, but they sort of like uh, stuck together because I think both got something so extraordinary from each other. Uh, as you said, every artist does need someone who is more of a worldly person so that the person, so that the artist can create. And Arvind Bhai, of course, got access into this amazing world of music and was his student and friend and supporter and secret keeper. And um, so I think that, uh, yeah, it's, you know, patronage is a very interesting space in the world of Indian classical music and the arts because it's not a formal space. It comes, you know, in the old days, it was the Maharajas who were the patrons. And then it became, um, you know, wealthy merchants who became the new Maharajas. And the Kachis in Bombay were a big part of that. And in Calcutta, it was the Marwaris, etc. Um, and then there seemed to have become, uh, you know, uh, there seems to be a gap in that space for a period of time. And you have the sort of corporate sponsorship coming in and then the uh, government coming in. But those are very distorted spaces because they're... Uh, their, their sort of uh, re their, their, their parameters for deciding what works and what, why art is, should remain art. Uh, probably that passion. That and the passion is, is, just, is, is just sort of diluted. And so it's problematic. And I think that really is something that exists even today because um, if that is not there in a large sense where you 
um, unconditionally give, even if you don't know what the outcome is going to be, uh, it can really not, you know, that's, the, the arts will never remain nurtured. So. I, it, it also, uh, Arvind Bhai's story reminds me of uh, someone who probably wasn't as uh, close, but in, in the United States, uh, one thing that struck me was uh, his c career didn't travel uh, into pop culture yeah. uh, like uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar's did. Yeah. Uh, but he did have a relationship with the West, with Europe, and then with uh, the United States. Yeah. Uh, and there was somebody who kept funding his travel, and somebody who, uh, uh, you know, paid him large sums of money in order to have him perform there, uh, also, uh, you know, nurtured him. Can you tell us yeah, about Yeah, so there's been a really interesting cast of characters that I met while researching this book, and one of them was this man called Lyle Wachowski, who is um, actually uh, a, a Jewish New Yorker who studied photography as an undergrad and was the son of a window fitter with zero background in classical music, Indian classical music, even India. And he happened to hear, it's really interesting how this story, uh, the trajectory of the story goes because he happened to hear uh, Ravi Shankar in the 1960s give a course at the City College of New York where he was studying and he fell in love with Indian classical music. And after that, he tinkered around in his own life, and at some point, he decided that he had to hear it again, and he would start going to concerts, and that was the time that Bloomingdale's, a department store in New York, decided to bring Vilayat Khan to New York because it was trying to position itself as an international store, and so it had a series of these... Um, sort of different festivals, one of them being an India festival, and Vilayat Khan was the icon who was brought in, and he performed, and this same person who'd heard Ravi Shankar 20 years ago and fallen in love with this interesting sound, heard Vilayat Khan and was smitten, and he spent the next so many years of his life giving him money to just be recorded in the best studios in New York with no real kind of concrete outcome. It was with no great, you know, idea of making business because when he had a series of concerts of Vilayat Khan Sahib all through America, they were only half full because, nobody, you know, he wasn't Ravi Shankar. And Vilayat Khan would always say, it must be the weather. <laughs> so, but he, they both carried on in this beautiful love affair and... Um, Actually, some of the most extraordinary recordings of Vilayat Khan Sahib, uh, which exist uh, today, uh, that are really sort of beautiful and seamless and don't belong to HMV, uh, are the recordings by Lyle, which um, he has shared with us and uh, will make it to the uh, audio book that is going to be published as well. Great. And didn't you also send us a clip of him talking about uh, yes. uh, Vilayat Khan Sahib? Can we, can we play that clip for our audience, please? How were you able to gain his trust in those early days? It was a process to gain his trust because I mean, he trusted me to drive him home, which is something to begin with. I mean, not knowing me. I mean, you're a, you're a brilliant musician. I mean, who, you know, you're getting into somebody's car. So who is this guy, you know? But uh, fortunately, it's a nice enough car, so he figured I must be okay. He, had a, he, he liked good cars. He liked Mercedes in particular, although I drive a Volvo. But that was good enough. Lyle, how were you able to gain his trust and become the preeminent recordist and archivist of his music? He had time when we were in Los Angeles, and so we recorded uh, the Bairavi, the one that you have, the Bairavi, a, a full, a full Bairavi, a lot of George Allah, and then Gotts uh, in California at uh, Sunset Sound, very, very good studio in uh, Los Angeles. And um, he seemed very pleased with it. And I was extremely pleased with it. I mean, there was no way of, of, you know... I mean, here I was sitting in a studio, and there was Vilayat Khan playing these extraordinary phrases. Particularly, he has a, a way of playing phrases that sort of tail off into like a, an overtone almost. Or overtone, yes. I guess it's overtone. And it's just ex extremely beautiful and touching. And I'm sitting there with some friends of mine in the studio, and I'm sitting there waving my hand as one does along, as, as he might even, the contour of the music, and, and, uh, and just amazed. I mean, he, he demonstrated to me once, he said, look, when you walk on stage, you just don't walk on stage. And he showed me how you walk on stage with, with a, shoulders squared and with dignity, and he practiced this. This was something that, that you know, 
he he gave thought to this to this presentation aspect of how you how you know how does the audience react to you you know it's, it's not just like hey everybody I'm here it's like no there's there's a sense of reserve and a sense of of um, of dignity that uh, that was him and which he felt that the music deserved. Wow. Seemed, he seemed very meticulous and his attention to detail, even, you know, when I read about his attention to his clothes and his outfits, uh, what other people wore, uh, you know, his car, Ghazala, yes. that he had a birthday party for. He Is had a car called Ghazala. He named his Mercedes Ghazala. It was a car gifted to him uh, by King Zahir Shah of Afghanistan, and he drove it all the way from Kabul to Bombay. Uh, and then he chose to have a party for it on Altamount Road. Uh, he dressed it up as his new bride. He put a big fat nose ring on the bonnet. And uh, he created a card, his wife and uh, an old, as coincidentally a family friend, Malu Devecha and his, and his wife, then wife Manisha, created a card which was in the shape of a Mercedes. And it said, um, to celebrate my new bride, Ghazala, and my old wife, Manisha, come and party. Um, I have that card with me. And uh, so he was kind of, um, I think, India's original and first rock star because he uh, really took everything to a kind of operatic level. Nothing for him was just simply ordinary. It was always to be highly accentuated and extraordinary. And um, I think he just had a lot of fun with life. He was a great ballroom dancer. He used to... Um, I, I think he was a, a connoisseur of perfume. He had a hundred pairs of shoes. Um, he would tinker with his car the same way that he could tinker with his instrument. And um, I, I heard that in, uh, to fight boredom, he would even um, uh, sit and cut and stitch his own clothes sometimes and drive everybody crazy in the process. <coughs> so I think this kind of like living larger than life, this perfectionism, um, his, uh, when I interviewed um, his children, they said that he would uh, lay aside what he was going to wear to a concert the previous night, and, and then next to it would be his little pan box, and everything would be so meticulously arranged, and, if any, and his watch would be next to it, and his hanky would be kept next to it, and it all had to be done in a very systematic and particular manner, and if anyone touched it, it there would be complete you know, hell would break loose. And not only would he dictate what he was going to wear, but he would also ensure that if any of his family members were attending the concert that next day, he would go through what they were going to wear and curate that. So this kind of, I mean, I think it was just that he really believed that nothing should be left to chance and everything had to be done in a very proper manner, whether it was the music or the attire or the manner in which you spoke. Um, but do you, do you think that, you know, uh, this, this persona of his, his personality, did it affect his personal relationships as well? Because when I, when I read the book, I mean, I, I see uh, a, a really fabulous career and all these wonderful quirks and such great achievements. But there's also pain. Yeah. There is also loss. Uh, it almost feels like everybody that he was close to uh, was estranged from him at some point. Uh, can you tell us a bit yeah, about Yeah, um, Apurva, I really was um, very careful about not hiding the dark side because I think that uh, in India we do tend to have this very hagiographic approach towards anyone who's great and, you know, you want to just uh, sort of like wash over the other stuff, which to me is actually doing them a disservice because you're not allowing them to be human beings. And yeah, they could be great artists and they could be somewhat fragmented human beings and it's quite all right. And I think to be able to write about something like that matter-of-factly with respect and quite objectively without judgment uh, is wonderful because you're allowing even the reader to enter somebody's life with all the perfections and imperfections and celebrating everything or, or just learn just reading about it or, or just sort of like entering that person's life <coughs> in a much more textured way so i think that um yes he did seem to have very fractured relationships with um every single family member and i suspect that came from 
the fact that he had such a difficult childhood after losing his fa uh, father at such a young age, he had to really go around begging for work and begging for mentorship and struggling and had serious times of de deprivation, um, which I think can impact anyone. And uh, so he became... Um, somewhat cynical perhaps on these fronts and if somebody rubbed him the wrong way it would as one of his family send, members said ki agar koi uske taraf city bachayenge wo to bandook nikalte the so it was uh, he he did, did seem to have a certain paranoia and it's very evident and i'm grateful that uh, his both his sons opened up to me about the very difficult relationship they had um, both Shajat and Hidayat, um, it took a while, but it, uh, they shared the, the pain and yet the absolute immense amazingness of being around a man like him. I mean, Shajat, I remember, told me these stories about how they would sit together when it was really cold in Shimla and it would be like all dark outside and there'd be these fir trees silhouetted against the darkness and he had just come back from his uh, trip in England because he'd spent a lot of time there at that time and Shujat must have been about six or seven years old or eight or nine and he brought back Cadbury's drinking chocolate which no one had tried over here until then and he made two cups of hot chocolate for him and Shujat and they took a razai outside and he said I want you to look at this cold and this warmth and the feeling that you're feeling sitting under this rezai with me, drinking this hot chocolate and looking at the stars. And I want you to bring that feeling into the music. And he talked about this whole idea of, you know, what goes beyond the notes. And there's another time where he talked about it with Shujat and Hidayat talks about it as well. And I'm going to... Um, read a passage later out about this uh, where he talks to Hidayat about how every single sensory experience you have, you have to sort of view that and how, how that can translate into your music. Whether it's the taste that you get when you're eating that amazing kofta curry or when you see a sunset and the colors you see or the sunrise and the colors you see and how they're different and how that has to translate into your music. So he used to sort of visualize his music and I think that part, part of his whole sort of like extreme obsession with things of beauty and with food and um, was all connected with his music. It wasn't sort of separate from that. So that, that level of detail where the time in which you put the namak into the khana while cooking it changes the khana. Oh. So uh, I think that that was what he wanted to bring into the music and as he once said, it's not as if it, uh, the, the, the listener may immediately get, get it, but his subconscious mind will. And he was sort of working on that level. So I, I, I even felt like, and you mentioned this in the book, how, how he would translate the pain in his life in, uh, into his music. And then there was, there was a lot of pain as well. Uh, his relationship with uh, his nephew Rais Khan, his relationship with uh, Shujat later on, his with brother. his brother. In Ayat Khan and Imrat Khan, Imrat Khan who, uh, who, we just, who just passed who away. Who just passed away, yeah. Uh, recently. And, but that was a very beautiful relationship till it, uh, the bonding between brothers, and, and till it, uh, it went south. Uh, uh, how, yeah, as they say, you can't have a, a, a lion and tiger in the same room after a while. And, and so basically, um, I think what had happened there, from what I understand, is that... Um, Vilayat Khan was a bit of a control freak and I think he liked everyone around him to basically, uh, you know, walk his talk rather, their own, rather than their own. And it seems to me that when uh, his younger brother, who was I think at least eight or nine years younger than him, was starting to come into his own, um, he didn't really like it and that's about it. <laughs> he kind of like, uh, was like, you know, uh, I, um, I'd rather that you just do what I do and do what I say and hang with me. And I think that that's where it all went, started going south. Um, and I, um, because, you know, I, I actually uh, went uh, all the way to St. Louis, Missouri to meet Imrat Khan because I was really intrigued by this kind of ambivalent relationship that they had where there was so much love. I mean, Vilayat Khan taught Imrat Khan for many years uh, when he was a child when, because they'd lost their father. So um, what happened? I wanted to know because they absolutely got so estranged. 
uh, that it was, uh, it was, it was, I had to, I had to sort of hear that story from Imrat Khan Sahib. And so I went to this random city called St. Louis, Missouri, which is in the middle of nowhere in America and um, found him. And he was um, quite, quite warm and welcoming. And I was terrified because I was basically opening a lid, which clearly um, nobody wanted to open. And, you know, when uh, we all come from families where we've seen all kinds of fights and this one was at a, I, I just heard my father laugh. Um, <laughs> and this one was really at a very extreme level because it was, it, it was amplified by artistic egos. Um, and so I, I went there and he was just like so happy that I was writing a book about his buddy bhaiya. And he just went on and on talking about how much he loved him and how he never wanted to compete with him. But, you know, God knows now all these stories get completely colored by, by, dis, by the selective um, nostalgia that we all rely on. And, uh, but there was definitely, I, I saw love, I saw pain, I saw... Um, estrangement and then we basically he made me listen to what is one of the most um, considered one of the most beautiful instrumental duets which happened between them even after their estrangement it's called a night at the Taj and it's in Rag Chandni Kedar it was recorded um, in 1967 by HMV and it's considered one of the most beautiful instrumental duets of all time um, because uh, Vilayat Khan, basically, his romantic imagination was so extraordinary that I think for the first time in, in the history of instrumental music in India, he created a whole narrative story and the music was basically playing out that story. And the story was that uh, on one full moon night on the uh, Taj Mahal, Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal's souls come down to earth for that one night and he shows her what he's built for her for the first time. And the whole piece is about them sort of rediscovering their love and dancing around the Taj Mahal. And the Sur Bahar plays the male Shah Jahan and the um, sitar plays Mumtaz. And you can hear this contrapuntal movement. And I'm going to read out a little bit about this. And, and can we, we play a little bit of the music? Uh, yeah. Bit, yeah. Um, and then there's, there's, an, uh, there's an amazingly sad moment towards the end of the music because the fairies come down from the sky to remind them that their souls have to go back up and the party's over. And all this is in the music. Um, so we listen to the music. I'll just read out a little bit, which, is, uh, which was on the record sleeve, written by G.N. Joshi, a very well-known uh, musician himself who used to work for HMV. For the first time in the history of Indian classical disc music, an attempt has been made to present through the media of instrumental performance an artist's conception of a universally known theme. It was woven around an imaginary incident involving that immortal pair of lovers, Shah Jahan, the creator of Taj Mahal, and his wife Mumtaz. Their souls, restless in heaven, are yearning for an opportunity to revisit their temple of love. Here goes, as we begin to play the opening side, the story in its chronological sequence as visualized by the artists. <clears throat> they were accompanied on the tabla by Nizamuddin Khan. And uh, can we have a bit of that music?
music has got me very inspired to talk about uh, uh, a strong female character, even though she made a special appearance in his life. And I'm sure there were other female characters, but uh, because Khan Sahib was, was known to be a lover of fine things. Uh, uh, and <laughs> uh, I, I find that the chapter on the uh, Chan Bala uh, fascinating, uh, you know. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a book in itself, uh, it lends itself to a great story, um, particularly because of uh, the rift between uh, Khan Sahib and his nephew, uh, Rais Khan. Rais Khan Sahib, right? So just tell me a little bit about uh, Chan Bala and this relationship of theirs. So um, the person who told me this story uh, shall not be named because I'm a good journalist and I'm I don't I'm sure you're here in the audience is. tonight. <laughs> But it was wonderful because they told me the whole story and then said, but don't put it in the book. <laughs> um, anyway, Chanbala was just one of the many, uh, you know, girlfriends that Vilad Khan had. And he would, I think, routinely promise all of them uh, betrothal and then at some point realized that he had no interest whatsoever. And so he had um, a friend who he would often... Uh, uh, adopt to, I mean, uh, uh, engage to uh, do the breakup, and this uh, could, uh, this often turned into really sort of like uh, incredible moments, uh, which um, I have referred to a little bit in the book. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Chandwala was not one to be left scorned for nothing, and so after Vilayat Khan left her, she proceeded to. Um, well, seduce his nephew Reis Khan, who uh, and 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 really sort of like fostered a relationship of um, great uh, rivalry between the two of them, which was already beginning because Reis Khan was turning out to be as good looking and as good a player as Vilayat Khan, and now they had uh, shared this experience, and so it's just led to many many funny moments. Um, Eventually, she. Uh, married. Uh, she did marry Rais, Rais Khan, Khan, and that was also short-lived because four wives later he ended up in Karachi, and then of course he passed away, as we all know. So. Right, which was last year. Yes. Right. So, um, I, I, you mentioned earlier how you know you haven't uh, shied away from uh, the darkness, the grey areas, and I really want to congratulate you, you. Uh, for that, as as somebody who's worked on uh, biopics and biographies uh, before. Uh, I know we live in a country where it's extremely difficult to do that because I think there's, there's so much uh, idol worship and people are just trying to yeah. protect images. Uh, but I did find that at the end of the book, uh, and you caught me completely by surprise because you had painted such a complete picture of a man who had his flaws and had his arrogance, but at the same time was, in, was, a, was a loving man who was charitable where it was required, uh, who... Uh, uh, you know, had had this relationship with his sons where he was not, uh, you know, there all the time. But when he was there, he really tried to give his all. But he was passionate to the end, even when he couldn't play uh, as the way he could perform on stage. The childlike enthusiasm to learn, to sit in front of somebody much younger than him and say, teach me this. Um, and I burst out crying at the end of the book. And I realized that you know, you, if you truly love someone, you, you love that person for their good and their bad and their flaws. If you're painting this picture of this wonderful person who has no flaws and you don't want to show his flaws, you probably don't love the flaws and you don't love that person. And that's the thing I took away, Namita, the wow. incredible love that you have for Vilayat Khan Sahib, for music and for writing. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I think um, to end our conversation, I'm going to read out uh, a passage which is, uh, involves um, a person who has really been the, the originator and a big part of this journey, uh, Vilayat Khan Sahib's younger son, Hidayat, who's here. And um, I, uh, I really appreciate the honesty with which he approached this book because he said to me very clearly that uh, Nams, even if I hate something you've written in the book, I'm not going to say anything because you have to just do justice to the truth. Um, this is a passage where 
we uh, talk about um, uh, Vilayat Khan uh, one, one evening in 1997. It was while father and son were on a concert tour in Oregon in 1997 that Hidayat felt a small shift take place in his music and his father heard it too. They had played together on stage. Because of the angle at which he was sitting, Hidayat had been able to closely observe his father's right hand modulations and saw how he extracted so many different tonal textures from the instrument. That night, when he was back in the hotel room and his father was in the shower, he pulled out Vilayat Khan's sitar and started playing, paying attention to minute differences in tone. Vilayat Khan emerged from the bathroom with a look of utter joy on his face. He knew his son had seen the music. All those years of berating him, arguing with him and persisting had paid off. His towel still wrapped around him, Abba sat on the bed and started talking to Hidayat in Urdu with the quiet enthusiasm that comes from finally having found a discerning audience. You know there used to be this Persian carpet in our house. If you brushed the carpet one way, it looked exactly the same. But if you brushed it the other way, son, you could see a slight difference towards the very end. It was so, so subtle that you might not even notice. You had to look carefully to tell the difference. Hidayat put his sitar down and sat cross-legged, resting his chin on his knuckles, listening intently. Bebu, the carpet was created by a master weaver, but he died midway, and the last bit was finished by his son. Obviously, the way the two men held the thread must have been slightly different. But that minute difference is what you need to get into your music. Pay attention to that level of detail. If you have that kind of eye and vision, then people may not consciously realize what you are doing. But on a subconscious level, it will transport them and grip them. Vilayat Khan reached into his suitcase and pulled out a deep red Kashmiri Jamavar shawl covered with paisleys. Look at these patterns. If you go close, each one looks so intricate. And when you look at it from afar, it is a totally different experience. It's the same with a Rembrandt painting, blurry up close. But when you move away, it all comes together. You have to put that into your music. In the pattern of a tan, the difference between the first phrase, the second phrase, and the third phrase is so minute that until you complete the entire tan, you don't see the full picture. Suddenly, when the tan is coming to an end, the full picture emerges, and it feels so defined, so complete. Vilayat Khan got up, kissed his son on the cheek, and then proceeded to turn on the television. A World Wrestling Federation game was in full swing. He watched it to the end of the fight. And now, I'd like to request Hidayat, my dear friend and fellow traveler on this journey, to play for us.
Thank you all so much. You've been an amazing audience. This is a very special day for me. It's been a dream of mine for many, many, many years. Everyone knows my father as the Ustad, Ustad Vilayat Khan. And it's amazing how many times they come up to me and tell me stories about him. And I listen to them as a person that, who doesn't really know him. And what is amazing about him is, as amazing an Ustad he was, but he was an amazing father. And he's really, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to be born into a house like this and especially to my father because I've had some amazing, amazing memories, uh, amazing times with him and, and one of the biggest lessons that he sort of gave me being an Ustad, being an amazingly successful human being is how to be sort of human and, and how to be in touch with the human side of yourself. 
and most of the world doesn't know him as that human being most of the world knows him as the ustad that he is and many years back i had this dream that i wanted to write i wanted to tell the world about who abba is not ustad bilad khan is and i was looking for this opportunity to sort of who could convey this message who could who could really uh convey the message of abba vilayat not ustad vilayat khan and somehow i connected with namita um we weren't really that good friends but something told me that she is the person to tell the story and i persisted her i told her that you know what we'll get the finances we'll get this we'll get that but honestly i wasn't able to do anything i'm a musician i mean i don't know anything about finances my dad didn't know anything about finances what do i know about finances so i wasn't able to help her out in any which way but somehow the story connected with her and she sort of decided to write this and this is about 4 or 5 years back and i would talk to her on and off and 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 one of the things that she said that i don't want any interference i'm going to write it the way i feel it's right and i had this trust in amita that she would write the story the right way from from where this book began we sort of started communicating and and somehow we connected and and over the years we became really really amazing friends and we connected on a much deeper level and i really honestly don't believe that there would be anyone else that would be able to tell the story of this great human being better than and then namita and i'm so thankful and i'm so like i really don't have words to express the way i feel today that this actually this book has actually come out and and we are all here in celebrating this so thank you all so much really from the bottom of my heart thank you all so much for coming and and being a part of this to the world he was ustad vilayat khan but to me he will always be abba and it means a lot to me personally that all of you all are here in the celebration also i'd like to acknowledge that very recently just a few days back we lost my uncle ustad imrat khan sahab uh the greatest surbhar player of our time i never really got to spend much time with him and got to know him personally but he was my uncle he was my father's brother so i remember him and and i ask all of you all to pray for his soul and thank you all for coming together today in celebration of my father's life the sixth string of ustad vilayat khan thank you all
I wish it didn't have to end. So much beauty, so much grace, so much honesty today that one can only be thankful. And I am deeply thankful. I've been part of this book's journey for some time now. And I would like to thank Namita for the trust she bestowed on us, on Westland, on me, Gautam, Ajita, all those of us who were fortunate to have worked on this beautiful work. I also want to thank the Royal Opera House and Avid Learning, Hamid Foundation, all those who've been part of making this evening possible as well. And of course, a heartfelt thank you to you, Hidayat, Anatosh. It's been marvelous. I know you will want to read this book. If you wish to have a signed copy, Namita will be signing copies in the foyer. Thank you very much for being here.